I met with a physicist named John Brandenburg. Now, John is a contract physicist for NASA and a brilliant man. And we ended up sitting there and we ended up using maybe 10 minutes of the, of the interview, but we talked for four or five hours. And John said, Dave, portals, multiple dimensions, they're all true. And he says, we as a group of physicists, there's eight of us around the world that get around and talk about this all the time. And mainstream media doesn't want to talk about it and doesn't want to give it its valid points. But Dave, it's been happening probably for eons. How it happens, when it happens, why it happens, we're trying to understand. And he says, but you got to also understand that there's some way that these portals are armed, meaning there's some intellect, intelligence behind the portal. And he says, so we would like to understand how we could use that portal to, say, point it at a tank in, an, in a field and just to take the tank right out of the field. And he said, in your research, Dave, where you have a small child standing in a national park right next to their parents, their parent, and this is 100% true, the parents turn their back for 30 seconds. They turn back around, the child's gone. They search, they yell, they scream. How far can a two-year-old go in 20, 30 seconds? They look all around, the kid's gone. They bring canines to the scene, they can't pick up a scent. Well, now how did that child get out of there so quick? Now bring on John D'Souza. John says, Dave, portals, multi-dimensions, they're all true. I said, John, how do you know this? He says, I was part of that group in the FBI that was sent out to investigate the really odd things. And he said that first series of the X-Files came straight out of my notebook. And he says, when people experience this, it's hard to believe until you experience it yourself. And I said, exactly, John. Now, imagine if I'm an investigator, somebody hears about me, their child's missing in a national park. I go to the scene and they say, Dave, what do you think happened? Can you imagine if I told the parents, yeah, maybe a, they fell into a portal or multi-dimensions, they were taken away? I'd look like an idiot. No one would believe me. And, and John says, exactly. Nobody would believe you. But it is a fact, and these things are true. You are listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala, your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here's Dr. Michael Sala. It's my great pleasure to welcome David Polides to ExoPolitics today. And uh, David has quite a distinguished background in law enforcement and uh, in missing person cases. So uh, welcome, Dave, to the show. Hey, Mike, it's great to be here. And I, I appreciate the invitation. Thank you. So how did it begin with you? I know you have a law enforcement background, so why don't you tell my audience uh, all about how you got involved in this work? Absolutely. I, uh, I grew up in California in the Bay Area. I spent 20 years in law enforcement, municipal law enforcement for San Jose Police. Uh, I ended up having a master's degree in human resources. I went to technology after law enforcement for a number of years. And eventually ended up moving to northern Montana, where I am now. And it's very cold, by the way. It's about minus two degrees outside. But uh, during that process, uh, I got involved in some missing persons work. And I started to write a series of books on people who disappeared in the wild. And I was told about this when I was doing peripheral research on another topic in a national park. And a couple of national park rangers came to my uh, room after hours and talked to me about a series of disappearances that they had in their park. And they both stated that they had investigated them individually while they were at other parks. And when they came to this park, they started to find coincidental issues with the missing that bothered them. And at the beginning, there was a lot of hoopla about the disappearance. There was a lot of uh, publicity. And then after about seven to 10 days, there was nothing. And they said, you know, Dave, somebody ought to look into this because something strange is going on. 
Well, the next morning as I was leaving that park, called a couple of law enforcement friends and I said, hey, is there anything to this? Are there many missing people in these national parks? A couple hours later, one of the guys called me back and said, Dave, there's a lot of missing people here and I've never heard of this. So maybe you've got something. So that started me on, a, this is my 12th year now looking at people that have disappeared in the wild. And that's not just national parks, National Forest Bureau of Land Management property. Did that for the first few years. And then I slowly started to expand out and look at other countries as well. And in this process of reviewing search and rescue reports, criminal investigative reports, et cetera, I started to have these stacks around my living room that had specific, what I call profile points of the missing. The number one profile point is uh, law enforcement brings a canine to the scene and the canine can't pick up a scent. Well, I worked on a SWAT team at San Jose. We had the canines attached to our unit. And I don't remember a time when the canines didn't find somebody uh, off a scent trail. So when I kept getting hundreds of these cases that canines couldn't pick up a scent, I thought, this is very odd. And then other profile points came up. Uh, namely, right about the time someone goes missing, there's a major weather event that inhibits the search. Uh, if people go missing and they're found, uh, many times they have no memory of how they went missing or how they were even found. Other times, if they're found, they're found in a place that's been searched 5, 10, 15 times. Well, I wrote 11 books about this, and they all start with the title Missing 411. And my son who was at USC's film school, took an interest in my work. And he said, dad, let's do a couple of videos about missing people. You know, you can reach a different level of clientele. I said, okay. So I was living in Colorado at the time. We went out and did eight videos. My video site, Can-Am Missing Project, like Canadian American, Can-Am Missing Project on YouTube. And from that, uh, Ben was transferring schools going from Miami University to USC he says, hey, I think we can do an entire movie about this. So I said, oh, this is, this is huge. He goes, no, Dad, just bear with me. And he co-directed the first movie. It's called Missing 411. Did a second movie about two or three years later called Missing 411, The Hunted. And then in February of this year, uh, I just released Missing 411, The UFO Connection. And right now, it's the number one rated documentary for 2022. And from my uh, distribution team, it's also the number one rated UFO documentary for the last 10 years. So I'm pretty proud of it. Uh, one thing I, I pride myself in my work, Mike, is that I deal in facts. I don't make a lot of assumptions. You won't hear a lot of theories come out of me. So the associations I make in my work are solid. Uh, one last thing is that don't buy any of my books on Amazon because you'll get ripped off. They're charging like $75 to $100 for my books. You come to my website, which is NA, like North America, nabigfootsearch.com. Go to the online store and the books are 25 bucks. Anyhow, that's it. Well, you know, that's, that's fascinating. Uh, I guess the first question would be, how many of the missing person cases in the wilderness, whether it's national parks or land bureau uh, areas, how many of those cases involve people disappearing and then coming back? Well, it's probably less than 20%. I see. Very, it, on the whole, it's very few. I see. Um, so you, you covered this in 11 books and your two videos, you, you covered uh, that phenomenon. And then your third video, the one that's just come out, uh, Missing 411, the UFO Connection, so I guess the big question is, well, how did you make that UFO connection? So just for clarity, on our YouTube channel, I have 450 videos, and this is our third documentary. that has got worldwide release on it. So it's, it's huge. Um, how I made that, it wasn't a planned event. A lot of times uh, with the documentaries, we write a storyline of what we think is going to happen. And then midstream, something happens and we get detoured. On this documentary, I've told this at lectures before, it almost felt as though I was getting led by my nose down a line that I never believed in. And 
I realized from the beginning that when the canines couldn't pick up a scent, there was something highly unusual going on. And I didn't quite understand what. And a, a series of law enforcement contacts that we interviewed several deputy sheriffs in the movie, they started to point to things that were unusual. The first thing was, is that in this one part of Wyoming that we highlight in the movie, everybody who disappeared was of German descent. And it wasn't as though that there was a great conglomeration of Germans in this specific area of Wyoming. These are people that came from different parts of the country to hunt and they were German. And oddly enough, they disappeared. And in one of my books, uh, I wrote about a series of physicists who disappeared around the world. And every one of the physicists were German. And I put our team on it for six months to try to find one case of just one physicist who disappeared who wasn't German. I couldn't find it. That's that's fascinating. That's a very important point, and especially given the kind of research that I've been doing. But before I kind of share some of that, I thought maybe uh, you can bring in the, the UFO connection because um, we're not just talking about UFO. Well, I mean, the, you, you talk about flying, tr you report people who have seen flying triangles, uh, that these are seen in the vicinity of these people that have disappeared. Some of them are of German descent or many of them are of German descent. So you know, there's this kind of UFO connection. So I just wanted you to elaborate on the, the UFO connection with these missing person cases and, of course, the, the German DNA element. Well, somebody told us about a group of hunters that were in the middle of nowhere in Idaho. Met these guys, and they were up a valley, and they were elk hunting. And in the middle of the night, they have a trailer parked next to a uh, creek in a very deep valley. Very, And one guy goes out to the truck to get something out of the truck. And one of the other hunters comes out the trailer. He's going to relieve himself. And then one guy getting into the back of the truck tends to look up as he gets into the truck. And he sees this giant triangle sitting above them. And the other guy coming back from the woods, this hunter yells, look up, look, look. And everybody comes out of the trailer, looks up, and they see this giant triangle, soundless, just hovering right at treetop about 70 to 80 feet above them. Everybody sees it, makes no sounds. And they had some burrows that they were using in the elk hunting. And I asked him what the burrows did, and he said the burrows did nothing, which was odd too. And then eventually this triangle slowly, very slowly moved up the canyon and went out of sight. Well, the interesting part of that to us is that just prior to this, we were in Western Washington and MUFON did an investigation about a series of workers. There were 15 of them working on the side of a hillside on Weyerhaeuser property just west of Mount St. Helens. And they were planting trees after this location got logged. And what they see is this odd shaped UFO come up the valley. Again, no sound, no propulsion, obvious. And it hovers over a group, again, of elk. And it then settles over one specific elk, lowers itself. And they said it was like the, the elk got frozen somehow because it wasn't running like the rest. And then somehow it grabbed this elk. There was no obvious cable or anything. It grabs this elk and carries it away. And I thought, wow, that's pretty odd. So then we go on to the hunters who saw the UFO in Idaho. And then we go to southwestern Cheyenne, the area near Cheyenne, Wyoming. And I already knew that all these hunters in this one area that had gone missing were German through our research. And we go into this area and we confirm that all of these hunters were also hunting for elk. So now we have three situations. We have one in Washington where an elk's carried away by a UFO. We have hunters in Idaho, which were elk hunting. 
that have a UFO hovering over them. And now we're in southwestern Wyoming. So we got start to go down this path of interviewing people, sheriffs, hunters, and not too far before this, uh, an elk hunter disappeared. And he was a, a guide. He wasn't just a hunter. He was somebody who was extremely experienced. And he had a girlfriend. Well, on one of the hunts just before he disappeared, he comes in and he's pretty rattled. And he tells his girlfriend, she asks him, what's wrong? And he goes, hey, as I'm coming out of the woods, a UFO is hovering over me all the way back to my truck. And I go, that's pretty odd. And then a couple of weeks after that, he goes back out elk hunting again. And he disappears. And he's not found. And we interview the search and rescue coordinators on this. And I asked the, the guy, anything odd about this? He says, Dave, the whole thing was odd. He said, we didn't find any tracks. We didn't pick any, any scent trail. You know, this guy was an experienced guide. We should have found him. We didn't. The whole thing was very odd. And then we interview the sheriff on another case in the same area. And he goes, Dave, we always find everybody. This guy, this German elk hunter from Minnesota, he disappeared. And we ended up finding a pouch of his. He ended up finding his rifle right near this creek. We don't find him. And we don't find, we bring in cadaver dogs. Cadaver dogs never hit on anything. And cadaver dogs were brought in on each of the cases that we investigated. So we have a UFO following somebody out of the woods that scared the hunter. Subsequent to that, weeks later, he disappears. Then we have a whole series of elk hunters in this same area that all disappeared. And then within 50 miles of this site is Warren Air Force Base. And we pulled documents where at Warren Air Force Base, the soldiers at the site had written reports about seeing UFOs hovering over missile silos there. So the, the associations I make are not happenstance. They're very solid here to their point to point facts. Now, of course, when it comes to what the UFOs are, I mean, that's where we get into, I guess, speculation or kind of like people giving reports. I, 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 for example, uh, one person that comes to mind is a former employee at Area 51, uh, Edgar Fouché, who talked about the TR-3B, a flying triangle that operated out of uh, this S4 area at Area 51. And uh, Fouché said that uh, these became operational in the late 1980s and early 1990s. And so we, we know that at least some of these UFOs belong to this, uh, well, I guess you'd call it a reverse engineering program or at least advanced technology aerospace programs operating out of areas like um, S4, or Area 51. So the question is, why would they be needing German uh, genetic uh, people? Well, your point's a good one about the TR-3B because you can go online right now and look at the movie poster for us, Missing 411, the UFO connection. And that design of the TR-3B that you can see looks just like the movie poster UFO that was hovering over the hunters in Idaho. And those guys did a hand drawing and off that hand drawing, we did the movie poster of that. So I think your point is very valid on that. But more interestingly, in that same spot in Wyoming that I was talking about, in 1967, a man named Carl went hunting alone for the first time ever. He always hunted with his wife. And as he's out hunting, he winds up on a series of elk. And he's lined up, ready to shoot, shoots. And he said, Dave, it was like almost slow motion. He said, I could see the bullet come out of the gun, hit something, bullet dropped. And he said, the elk never moved. I went down, I picked up my bullet, lined up again, and somebody, it was some type of human type entity, walks up to him and makes mind contact with him and starts talking to him. The next thing he knows, he's on a craft. And this craft takes him supposedly to a different location. And he says he can see out the windows and he thought it was earth zipping away out into the distance. He gets to this new location 
and he's walked behind this giant screen. And the entities tell him, you're not what we need. We're sending you back. And Carl says, what do you mean? He goes, that's okay. You're just going to go back. And I asked him, what do you think they meant? And Carl says, I think they didn't want me because I had a vasectomy. And now here's the point to my research that's super important. Carl says he wakes up falling, hitting the ground and rolling down a hill. I can't tell you, Mike, how many cases I have where people have been found where they've been dropped into locations that make no sense at all, where you and I would never go on a hike, but they were dropped indiscriminately and died from the fall. And one of the things I talked to Carl about is, it seems like they didn't really care much about you. If they dropped you at distance, he goes, Dave, I hurt my shoulder bad. And when I was eventually found, I was taken to a hospital and I was evaluated and I had tuberculosis scars on me. My doctor met me at the hospital and all those scars were gone. Subsequent to that, Carl went through three different polygraph tests by three different law enforcement agencies, passed every one, was interviewed by a psychologist for the University of uh, Wyoming multiple times. Person said that they thought Carl was telling the truth. This was the case in the 60s that fits exactly with the rest of the cases in that Wyoming sector. That is fascinating that he saw someone, um, now we don't know who it is, a figure in black, because immediately what that brought to mind was the famous Betty and Barney Hill case. And one of the earlier, early, earliest reports by uh, Barney Hill when they were taken on that craft was that he said he saw a person in a Nazi uniform, but he didn't believe it. And and so when they when the, the psychiatrist, I think it was uh, Benjamin Fuller, uh, he when he was uh, interviewed, he, he kind of rationalised it away. Well, it couldn't have been a, a Nazi on that craft. I had to be imagining that. But, um, you know, I just wanted to kind of raise that because here you have in, later in the 60s someone being taken on one of these craft. Again, you have someone in a kind of black uniform. Well, and Carl did say that when he was on this planet, per se, he also saw other people dressed sort of like us that seemed to be there. And he said, no, I didn't talk to him. But he said, Dave, they, they looked like us. They kind of were dressed like us. And the entity that came and met him was dressed all in black. And from the description of him that we have in the movie, it to me, it seemed as though that that entity was maybe a robot because it didn't have natural features and it didn't speak like you and I. Just just a feeling that Carl and I both talked about, and it probably in his mind was true that this wasn't a real live person. But when he went back there, he goes, there were people walking and talking and it was just like you and I. Okay, okay. So so in that case, uh, we might be talking about some kind of advanced civilization using automatons, robots to take people. So as, as far as um, this, this kind of pattern where you have uh, Germans being taken and then a German or, or someone of, of German descent, Carl Higdon, I guess he was of German descent, but he was infertile. I mean, you know, is it fair to make that inference that what we have here is a pattern pointing to someone involved in these uh, in this UFO phenomenon that needs uh, German genetics for reproduction reproduction purposes? I would say that as of right now, the majority of any one heritage that's taken in our research, and I've, I've researched about five to 6,000 cases of missing people. Germans are at the top of that list. Uh, and then you think about the intellect involved in the people that are taken, the physicists. And I also have a great number of physicians that are taken as well, taken, that disappear. And um, 
it's a, it's nothing that we were looking for. It's just we stumbled onto this. I asked that question because some of the people I've been working with, um, you know, for example, there's the former Navy intelligence operative that says that you know during the Second World War he was part of a a, a Navy espionage program that was operating out of uh, occupied Germany and that they saw Germans developing these flying saucer craft and that the Navy knew all about this and that after the war deals were done and and the the Germans moved their fleets to South America and to Antarctica. So those those rumours have been around for a long, long time. You know, there's there's a lot of evidence, both kind of fairly solid or or well-credentialed people and other evidence that's kind of like more like conspiracy folklore. But but nevertheless, there's, you know, a lot of evidence pointing to the fact that there's a German space program that could be dated back to the Second World War era. And, And if that's the case, then we have a very intriguing data point for what you have been observing with the missing people. So you watched the movie, right? Yes, I do. So at the beginning, for the people who haven't seen it, at the beginning that we we have this scene and we use scenes from downtown Japan and or Tokyo and some other locations. And I talk about, are we the ant farm for another civilization? Or is somebody looking down at us and using us as that ant farm idea? Like if we have that wooden structure with the glass in our house and we watch the little ants run around, and we want to take an ant out, well, are they looking at Earth and watching them run around? And do they have some ability to differentiate, say, a Hispanic person, a Negro person, Black person, and a German person? And oddly enough, in this one area of Wyoming, it apparently, somehow or another, it's going on. And especially... That one group I talked about, the physicists, they're all German. That just happenstance? I don't know. Well, it's, it's a very interesting observation because, I mean, if if we like look at those kind of claims that there's a German space program that's involved in colonizing other planets, well, if they have a lim- limited population from which to draw upon, uh, whatever whatever colonies they spawn might be threatened because of the lack of genetic diversity. So that would give us one rationale for why it is that these UFOs, these black triangles and other uh, UFOs are involved in taking Germans, especially scientists, uh, because they would be very useful for uh, colonising other planets or worlds in other solar systems if, if the program is advanced, as some people claim. Is there any other heritage besides German that's being taken that you've heard? Uh, no, I, I really haven't. Um, yeah, that that seems to be the predominant one is is the German um, that's being taken, and I, I know that's just from listening to you on Coast to Coast. You you've been pointing that out. I mean, there there have been other people that have been involved in the abduction phenomenon. Uh, for example, um, Ray, uh, sorry, uh, Dan Sherman, he wrote a book, uh, Above Black. And I don't know if you're familiar with that, but he said he was he was in the Air Force for 12 years and he was stationed at the NSA uh, to do some electronic uh, surveillance work. And he was involved in an Above Black project where he was monitoring communications. Eventually, that kind of really disturbed him that these were communications and he was trained for the job that these were communications between a group of what he described as grey extraterrestrials and NSA authorities and they were reporting on people being abducted. They were giving reports but there wasn't any kind of uh, description of you know racial categories or anything like that. It was just sheer numbers of, of people being abducted and he thought that this you know, that there, this was evidence of a, a kind of agreement that had been reached between the aliens and U.S. authorities. And he, he said he was so disgusted when he realised what was going on that, you know, he, he arranged for himself to be discharged from his position. 
in the first documentary we did, it's just called Missing 411. You can watch it on Amazon. Uh, we brought in Les Stroud, a man, survivor man. Many people know him. And Les and I had worked together in the past on some of his projects. And he said, Dave, if I can ever help you, bring me into your work and we'll do it. Well, I had a series of young children under three, four years old that had disappeared and were found phenomenal distances from where they were last seen. And anyone who's a parent knows that a little two-year-old isn't going to go a long ways in the woods. Well, we had this one case where a young two-year-old boy disappears in Oregon, and he's gone for like 16 hours. And then he's found 12 miles away over two mountain rangers, ranges, over barbed wire fences, face down in a snowfield, still alive. Unbelievably, we found this person later in life. He was like 55, 60 now. And we talked to him about what happened. Well, we knew the point he was last seen at his house right before dinner and the point he was found at. So we brought Les in and we said, hey, we want you to recreate the path that this boy took. So he went with a film crew, went through the woods. And he said, Dave, the first point is, is that it might be 12 miles the way the crow flies, but you could double or triple that because that's people don't walk the way the crow flies. They take a roundabout way to another, another location. At about midnight, Les stops the crew and goes, we're stopping right here. We're going to walk off a cliff. We're going to, someone's going to get killed. This is ridiculous. This boy did not do this. And in talking to that man today, he said, obviously, I have no real recollection, but I could tell you what my mom said. And he walked out on the set with the clothes he was wearing at the time that his mom kept. And he said, my mom just said, God was watching you because there was no way you made that journey alone. And they lived in the middle of nowhere in eastern Oregon. There, were, there wasn't even a neighbor nearby. So it's not like somebody came by and kidnapped him. There had to be something going on. And the reason we did a series of young kid cases in that first movie was to make it easy to understand for the people. I never said it, but there obviously was something else involved. These young kids can't travel these great distances in that time frame. And so that was the transition for us going from the first movie, Missing 411, to the second movie, Missing 411, The Hunted, to this last one, the UFO connection. I wonder if you've um, kind of like uh, looked at some of the abduction research by people like uh, Dr. David Jacobs, uh, 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 Bud Hopkins, where they talk about this kind of systemic program of people being abducted by you know, grey aliens and genetically being modified or interfered with and then being returned. And, and I remember them doing statistics and they oh, they did some poll and they, they came up with some incredible number. I think they estimated like up to 3 million Americans had been involved in this kind of abduction. So you know, have you kind of like linked what you're doing with those studies? So, Mike, I'm one of these weird guys that I was custom made to do this work. I never knew I would end up here, but I've been a MUFON investigator for 16 years. So I've seen all of these things. I've read all of these cases. And right after uh, I left technology, I was hired by some people, super wealthy people who had Bigfoot encounters when they were very young. And they said, Dave, I know you're leaving. I know you don't want a job but we want to hire you to go out and just research if Bigfoot is a fallacy, if it's true, what it is. If it's a fallacy and it's all made up, tell us. If there's something to it, tell us. Make a long story short, I said no three times. The fourth time they came back at me and they offered me this tremendous amount of freedom and a tremendous amount of money to support the science part of this that we wanted to do. So I have this, and I did that for three or four years. So we have this Bigfoot background, my law enforcement background, the MUFON background, and then I've been tracking these missing people and writing these books for 12 years. So I'm really one of these unusually balanced people 
on a multitude of grounds to do research. I hear what you're saying. And uh, I remember I was reading a book by John Mack and he, I think he really put it into focus where he didn't jump to any conclusions, but he said, you know what? If you look at all these stories of what these people say, they're almost all the same. And they're almost all explaining what happened to them. And, you know, in his words, he said, there's got to be something to this. And he was ridiculed by his staff at the school, et cetera, but he hung, he hung on. So, yeah, I'm with you, Mike. I understand. Well, another explanation that is worth looking at, I know you interviewed um, John D'Souza, a former FBI agent, 25 years, and, and he talked about his kind of uh, work within the FBI looking at these uh, X-Files cases, and he talked about parallel dimensions. And uh, so you want to, like, explain what John D'Souza's uh, theory was? So take a step back a little bit. I did a show for the History Channel called Vanished. And I was one of the executive producers. So I wrote the, the storyline for it. And part of that was them flying me to Wisconsin, where I met with a physicist named John Brandenburg. Now, John is a contract physicist for NASA and a brilliant man. And we ended up sitting there and we ended up using maybe 10 minutes of the of the interview, but we talked for four or five hours. And John said, Dave, portals, multiple dimensions, they're all true. And he says, we as a group of physicists, there's eight of us around the world that get around and talk about this all the time. And mainstream media doesn't want to talk about it and doesn't want to give it its valid points. But Dave, it's been happening probably for eons. How it happens, when it happens, why it happens, we're trying to understand. And he says, but you got to also understand that there's some way that these portals are armed, meaning there's some intellect, intelligence behind the portal. And he says, so we would like to understand how we could use that portal to, say, point it at a tank in, an, in a field and just to take the tank right out of the field. And he said, in your research, Dave, where you have a small child, standing in a national park right next to their parents. Their parent, and this is 100% true, the parents turn their back for 30 seconds. They turn back around, the child's gone. They search, they yell, they scream. How far can a two-year-old go in 20, 30 seconds? They look all around, the kid's gone. They bring canines to the scene, they can't pick up a scent. Well, now how did that child get out of there so quick? Now bring on John to Souza. John says, Dave, portals, multi-dimensions, they're all true. I said, John, how do you know this? He says, I was part of that group in the FBI that was sent out to investigate the really odd things. And he said, that first series of the X-Files came straight out of my notebook. And he says, when people experience this, it's hard to believe until you experience it yourself. And I said, exactly, John. Now, imagine if I'm an investigator, somebody hears about me, their child's missing in a national park. I go to the scene and they say, Dave, what do you think happened? Can you imagine if I told the parents, yeah, maybe a, they fell into a portal or multi-dimensions, they were taken away. I'd look like an idiot. No one would believe me. And, and John says, exactly. Nobody would believe you, but it is a fact and these things are true. So now. I have a world-renowned physicist, John Brandenburg. I have a retired FBI agent, John D'Souza, both telling me almost the exact same things. It's, it's, it's bizarre, John, or Mike. Uh, uh, it is really bizarre. Well, I, th I think it's a very important um, perspective to consider that uh, some of these people uh, disappearing because somehow a portal is activated near them and or whether people are consciously manipulating portals so that so that certain people can go in um, I, I know yeah there there's something about vibration frequency people's ability to be able to vibrate at certain levels and 
some people may spontaneously enter these portals because they can just uh, manifest one, you know, because maybe they go into a meditative state. Because I think one of the things about nature, and and, and I'm experiencing that too, living here in uh, um, in kind of like the very close to the Smoky Mountains next to a lake, you know, when you're uh, looking at the beauty of nature around you and you're just kind of like you get into this meditative state and you can go into a really deep place. And and I my guess would be that for some people, maybe they just like because they go into that really deep place, they consciously open up a portal and they just kind of walk through it and they disappear to the to our kind of 3D reality because we're kind of like, you know, anchored in our normal perceptions, you know, the, the kind of beta brainwave, you know, doing things. But they because they get into these meditative states, they open up these portals, walk through, and then it's like, well, <laughs> they, they're not trained. They don't know. Well, how do you get back? And they don't know. And, uh, and they're gone. So at Skinwalker Ranch, uh, the National Institute of Discovery of Sciences, uh, a team hired by Robert Bigelow to work the ranch for a number of years, the head man at that team was a man named Colin Kelleher. I've actually met with him twice in Las Vegas for days at a time because he was trying to help me with our research. One of the things that they talked about was is that they had a team of physicists on the ranch and they watched, they described it as almost like a window frame appear above a meadow at the ranch, off the ground. It opened and they saw a bipedal entity come out, jump down onto the field, the window closed, the sky looked as normal, and this creature ran off into the woods. Well, that's pretty strange. And then as you say, some people may have the ability to open them, true. But one thing that Brandenburg told me is, Dave, the reason we know there's gotta be intelligence behind this is that we can walk down a street anywhere in New York, San Francisco, wherever. And you don't see people disappearing in front of you. It's like a targeted response to when nobody's looking, something is happening. And in our work, one of the profile points I list in the books, it's called point of separation. Two people walking down a trail together, and this most, mostly happens to hunters. They go out and they walk out to an area to hunt together. And one guy says, I'll walk this way around the mountain. Another guy says, I'll walk that way. And then one guy comes back and another guy never comes back. That point of separation, something happens. Whether I take my eyes off of you or whether we turn our back on each other, it can happen that quickly. Just like that little boy I said next to the people. I can't tell you how many cases I have like that. So there's some intellect behind that portal to be able to understand when you're not looking, something's going to happen. So in terms of then, uh, like, what is an explanation? Is there a kind of overriding explanation? You know, so far we've looked at you know, the possibility that uh, you know, these are some kind of uh, UFO phenomenon related to aliens. Uh, looked at portals, people disappearing through portals, um, possibility of these craft belonging to some kind of uh, civilization, a German civilization, or that needs German genetics because they want to colonize other worlds and they need that. Um, would would they? You know, those are three explanations. Are, are there others that people need to know of? Well, here, here's a good explanation or a good story for one of those. We were doing a research on a case at Mesa Verde National Park, kind of near the Four Corners area of the U.S. A man named Dale Staling disappeared. And he disappears, his family, his entire family's there at the park. He doesn't come back from this hike. And the National Park Service kicks it into gear and starts a big search. Well, the next morning, search is still going on, and the National Park Superintendent for the park had a meeting that morning with a reporter to do a story on the park. 
The reporter gets there, doesn't even know anyone's disappeared. But the chief ranger says, hey, superintendent's really busy. We've got an emergency going on at the park. Come back in two hours. Go take a hike around the trail and come back. So she does. She goes and takes this hike. About two hours, uh, or I'm sorry, about two miles out from the park headquarters on this trail, she stops and she hears this person calling for help. And she tries to call back and the person doesn't respond other than the same, hey, I'm here, help me. You know, nothing specific to that woman, but just to help me, help me, I need help. So the woman gets really scared. She literally runs the two miles back to park headquarters, runs into the park's offices and says, hey, and reports exactly what I say. The chief ranger and the superintendent turn white and they look at each other and say, that's the same location late last night. Somebody else reported somebody calling for help. We sent 25 people out to the area with canines. We never found anything. And then the superintendent looks at the woman and goes, yeah, and that's the area where we're looking for a missing person. Now, in the movie, in the Vanish show that I did for Discovery Channel, Prometheus Entertainment did not want to put this on the show because they thought it made the Park Service look bad. I tried to explain to them, this doesn't make them look bad. This, what if this person is either trapped in another dimension or trapped in a portal can't get out, can't see, and is calling for help, yet can still be heard. And this is exactly what we asked Brandenburg. And he says, Dave, that's an exact scenario. That's it. We don't understand why they can't be in that position, but maybe they, un they didn't know they were going in, and they don't understand how to get out. Now, make a long story short, years later, after Dale disappeared, He's found leaning against a tree, long deceased, in an area that had been searched about 20 times. Nobody could have understood why he was in that position and how they missed him. Fascinating. So one of the uh, things that you talk about in the documentary is the underwater connection or that there are lakes or large bodies of water in the vicinity of these people that are disappearing. So uh, that kind of brings up another possibility. Are uh, uh, beings with underground or bases underwater somehow involved in this? Great point. Again, this was something that we never thought we'd find. I'm big on maps. And when I worked on task forces as a policeman, we would always map the locations in the city where crimes would occur. And we always knew that a serial bank robber or a serial rapist would never commit a crime in their own neighborhood for a variety of obvious reasons. So we would always map it. Well, when I started to do missing persons cases and I started to get hundreds across the US and Canada, I had a huge map on my wall and I was putting little pins in where these cases went. And we ended up making a map of the United States and Southern Canada of all of these cases and 64 clusters of missing people. Now, very oddly, starting at North Dakota and going south to Northern Texas, there's almost no cases right through the heart of America, North to South. Very strange. It didn't make any sense to us. Uh, I had a team, we worked on this for eight years. And then suddenly we get uh, a call from someone from the U.S. Geological Survey. And they said, Dave, have you ever looked at the Ogallala Aquifer? I said, I don't even know what that is. And they go, go get it up on a map. Lay it over your map and just look at it. And son of a gun, over that area of the U.S. where there's nobody missing, that's almost an exact fit for the Ogallala Aquifer. Now, that could be happenstance too, but in this movie, a huge bombshell dropped on us. We were in the city attorney's office in Rock Springs, Wyoming, talking to the city attorney about a retired teacher, German teacher that disappeared hunting. 
And he was also a, uh, the regional director for MUFON Wyoming. And he says, hey, Dave, did you ever hear about the case of this uh, guy digging a well just north of us? I said, no. And he says, yeah, about 25 years ago, this guy bought this piece of property. And what he needed was water, but he couldn't find any. And about two or three years into his time on this rural piece of land, he started to have these saucers flying over his property. He says, this guy was rock solid, salt of the earth type of man, just a farmer, rancher trying to make a living. He says, and then they landed and they started to talk to him. And they walked him over to a spot on his property and they said, dig here. You're going to find your water. So he had some geologists come out and they said, no, there's no water here. Don't even do it. Then he said, okay, I'll have some uh, drillers come out. I'm going to just drill it. I don't care what anybody says. I'm going to believe what the alien said. We're going to drill. Drillers come out and they say, no, we're not going to waste your money. There's nothing here. We know there's nothing here. So he ends up buying an old, old U.S. tank that had a mechanism in it that he refurbished and made into his own drill. 130 feet down, he hits a gusher. Huge amounts of water. Now, what is that? That is an offshoot of the Ogallala Aquifer. I think it's stunning. I think it is, it's a very small arm of the aquifer. Now you have to ask yourself, why would those, I don't know what they are, aliens, creatures of earth, I don't know what they are, but why would they tell this man to drill right there? I mean, that, that, that is fascinating. What, what was their motivation for doing that? Very interesting. I, I know just... Want- we had a lot of talks about this and just a lot of people with MUFON backgrounds and such. And a lot of people came up with some interesting thoughts. One of them was maybe they needed an entry exit point in that part of Wyoming because of all their own activity in Wyoming. I don't know, but I'll just throw it out. Well, water naturally is uh, essential for uh life and any population uh, needs water. Now, if, if you have uh, underground populations or kind of facilities underground, you, know, you would probably know a lot about the natural aquifer system and, and water tables, and you would know a lot about that. So so maybe the the occupants of that craft telling that uh, that person about the how, you know, where to drill to find the aquifer, maybe they were just doing him a favor because they, they knew it so well. It didn't mean anything to them. But, um, yeah, maybe that's just suggestive of there's so much under the ground and there are civilizations there that interact with us but in ways that have to be kept secret because surface humanity isn't ready for that yet. So one of the, one of the things that people always ask, they say, well, Dave, What's, what's with this southwest or southeast corner of Wyoming? Why would all of this interest be there? Interestingly, the elk that was abducted in Washington, after it was abducted, the owners of that property contacted the Washington Fish and Game, and they told the owners that there was a high prevalence of chronic wasting disease in the elk and the deer in that area. Now, chronic wasting disease is 100% deadly. It's a prion disease. It, and mad cow disease in Europe was also a prion disease that attacked cows. And back in the day, the people said, oh, it'll never cross from crow- cows to humans, so don't worry. Well, we all know now that it did cross over and it killed hundreds of people. They ended up killing like 30 million cows in Europe because of chronic weight, because of mad cow disease. Well, back in 1967, 68, 
uh, the University of Colorado at Fort Collins was doing a study on chronic wasting disease at a facility. And supposedly some of these elk and deer got loose. And that's ground zero for chronic wasting disease in the United States. Most people have never even heard about this. It's in 20 plus states. And right now, almost every county in Wyoming has chronic wasting disease. If a deer, elk, moose, uh, caribou gets it, they're dead. Uh, it can be spread through the urine. It's a horrible disease and not one fish and game commission has a handle on how to stop it. And again, that Southeast corner of Wyoming, ground zero, it's super prevalent. So the thought pattern that several people have stated to me is that Dave, well, obviously they're trying to monitor our food source at this point. They took that elk from a high population in Washington. And now when Carl Higdon was taken, was he, when he was lined up on the elk, when he got onto the craft, he said that the three elk he was lined up on were sitting on the craft when it took him back to their base. And he, the entity told him that they come down and they take these things every once in a while. So it's, it's something monitoring our food source that we don't understand. Well, that's interesting. Um, I mean, are, are they just monitoring uh, the elk and our food source, or are they using them for maybe repopulation or take to, as breeding pairs uh, for for their needs? Maybe they they need to breed them. Um, you know, I, I guess those are those are questions. I mean, that's we can ask those questions. But um, yeah, that's that's interesting that they're take that they're taking elk as opposed to cattle and you know and i guess everyone knows has heard about you know the, the whole cattle mutilation phenomenon and how that's connected to ufos linda malt house talked about that quite a lot uh, but this seems to be something separate or, or are they connected great questions the, the issue i have with them taking breeding pairs is that they're taking, uh, and I can only speak for the areas that I know that they've been taken, is high concentration areas in Washington that have been identified by Washington Fish and Game, and then the highest concentration anywhere in the U.S. of chronic wasting disease in that region of southeast Wyoming. So if they're taking them, they're taking disease, they're, there's a great chance they're taking diseased animals. Well, I mean, I, I know I know you mentioned in one of the cases. Uh, I think it was the the Carl was it the Carl Higdon case, the the guy that was infertile, that he had some kind of chronic lung problem. But when he went onto the craft, and you know they did whatever they needed to do, scan him, and then said, "Well, you know, you you you're not good for us. We're going to take you back." And they dropped him off wherever. But his lung disease was cured. So. I mean, I guess that raises the question. I mean, maybe they don't care if the elk have this kind of uh, disease, that they have the technology to cure it. And and so they just, maybe maybe they figure, well, if they take diseased cattle, no one's really going to, or diseased wildlife, no, no one's going to, like, bother about it because they figure, well, you know, the, those animals would have died anyway, so why are we going to bother about it? Well, you brought up a good point about the uh, cattle mutilations in We've talked about that here. And what we talk about is if whatever's taking these cattle uh, can obviously take them under our noses and people will never even see them because nothing's ever really truly been identified about what's doing this. But why put that mutilated cattle cow right back in the same position why not just jettison it, in, it into space, put it on the top of a mountain, throw it in the middle of the ocean? What's the message they're trying to send by putting it right back in their backyard? Maybe they want people to be uh, take notice. Maybe they're trying to intimidate people, maybe kind of make people frightened. You know, maybe there's a group out there that, definitely want humans to kind of like be concerned about the others. I think those are all valid points. And uh, 
I think the message of putting it right back is as important as why they're taking it. And I wish we understood why. Well, you know, this is probably going a bit dark, but I, I need to ask it because you're the expert on missing persons. And Linda Moulton Howe says that she also began doing research on uh, mutilated humans, humans that had been taken by UFO and had been mutilated just like cattle. But she was warned off. She was told by some operative, she said she was she says that she was told not to talk about this. So do you know anything about that? So I've looked at 6,000 cases plus all around the world. And I have never come across a case that of a mutilated human that matches our profile points. There's one case where a 17-year-old German boy disappeared in Malta and he was found and there was there was some type of animal that the government in Malta said ate away to, at his abdomen and ate away part of his internal organs. And it was, it was pushed by some news agencies that it was organ harvesting or it was mutilation. I don't think so. I, I read some of the reports and it appeared to be pretty mundane explanation for what happened. Now, I know that there's reports out of South America that come out that have stated that there's been some mutilated people. Honestly, Mike, in my own personal opinion, that the reports that come out on these things are so incredible that it would take a very good investigative timeline, time frame, and good investigative processes to, to make me believe that it's still happening, if it ever did happen. I don't know. But in certain parts of the world, as you probably know, investigators aren't real credible. And it's hard for me to wrap my mind around some of these investigations and some of the things I've read. I'm not saying that I wouldn't believe it because I would believe it if it came from some credible source. I haven't seen it. Well, well, I know Linda Moulton Howe's kind of like a very good and thorough researcher and, yeah. uh, and she definitely saw something within this human mutilation phenomenon that was worth investigating, but she kind of ran into this brick wall of this was a national security thing. So, and, and it's the opposite to what you, you said about the cattle mutilations. I mean, clearly the cattle were being dropped off and it was okay, or people were allowing this to be kind of photographed and studied. And But in, in these cases of humans going through something similar, uh, that was covered up. Uh, anyway, that's Linda Moulton Howe's kind of like uh, research from what what I know, and and I don't want to misquote her, but but I re recall her saying or that um, this was something that uh, yeah she she did find her, that she had done some research into that. Let me let me tell your audience, give you some background on deputy sheriffs in rural counties. I don't know if you live in a city or a county, but the counties in the United States are the law enforcement is governed by a, a sheriff's office. The sheriff in those counties is an elected official who doesn't respond to anybody else other than the public. And that's it. They're elected. They don't have to report to anybody. The county manager, nobody. They're like an independent entity. And every time I've gone to a sheriff anywhere in the U.S., and ask for information about a case, bang, quick, yes. Most of the time they'll go on, on, on video with me. I've had tons of them in my movies and they'll tell you the truth. And the truth may be contrary to what mainstream media may wanna say, but they will tell you the truth. I've never had a sheriff say, oh, I can't talk about that. Or somebody's told me I can't talk about that. It's just the opposite. These men and women that are the sheriffs in these counties, they're the good old souls. They want to, They want the truth out there, and they won't be intimidated. That's that's my experience. Okay, so you've essentially accumulated a lot of data that uh, this phenomenon is happening, not just in the U.S., around the world. And I guess you're not in the business of kind of like answering all the possible 
explanations that there are. You're just putting together all the data to say that this is real, this is happening, and people need to take it seriously. So now, are people taking it seriously? Is like I know uh, the U.S. Congress has uh, convened, uh, I guess, two task forces now. I mean, uh, there's the uh, what is it? The kind of like uh, all domain anomaly, uh, all domain anomaly resolution office that's looking at UFO reports that are a national security threat. And of course, now you have this interagency group that's been convened by the Biden administration, headed by Jake Sullivan, to look at uh, these kind of UFOs that have been shut down recently. So. Is anyone looking at your data? Great question. So eight years ago, I filed a Freedom of Information Act request against the National Park Service for a list of all of the people who have disappeared on their property. And they stated they don't have a list. Now, Mike, you could go to any sheriff's office anywhere in the United States and ask the sheriff for a list of all the missing people in their jurisdiction and within two hours, he'd have that de- that list on his desk or her desk. Everybody knows you have lists of missing people. Now, the National Park Service has a list of all the movies that have been made on their property online right now. You can go find that. So that must have been important to them. So when they got back to me four months later, they said, Mr. Politis, um, we know that you are an author but we're not going to recognize that. Uh, We don't have a list. And I said, okay, so what if I was willing to pay for a list? And I asked you to go out and get it. They said that will cost you $1.4 million. Now, subsequent to that, they didn't know this, but a family brought me in. They didn't lie. They just said, he's a friend of the family. And we went into one of these special agents offices for the National Park Service. There are six different regional special agent offices of the National Park Service across the U.S. A special agent is the detective part of the National Park Service police. Well, this family had a family member disappear. And so they took me in and they said, yeah, he's with us. He's a family friend. They didn't ask me anything. They didn't recognize me either. So I go into this meeting and this special agent says, oh, yeah, we have the file. The file's 20 years old. Nobody's looked at it in 20 years. The person was completely obvious. I mean, honest, I I respected that. So I got to ask some questions. I said, so how many special agents in this office? He goes, each office has about six special agents. And how many cases on missing people does each agent have? Well, it varies between three and 20 maybe. Okay. So then I'm thinking, they want to charge me 1.4 million to get a list of names when each special agent at each one of these offices has a desk full of files, how long would it take them to write the name down in each one of those files and give it to the head special agent in the office? Have that head special agent hand it over to the National Park Service superintendent. Mike, if that took a total of six hours, I'd be stunned. So I wrote a thing back to the National Park Service and said, I will send you $3,000 for a laptop. And then I'll send you 220 clipboards so they can go into all the national parks that have jurisdiction under you. And you can put this in the communication center so they can write down all of the missing people that come in. And at the end of the year, just send me the list. Or have somebody who's an intern working for you for free to put together the list. They refuse to respond. They refused to even acknowledge our assistance on this. And they still demanded 1.4 million for a list. So we got mad and we worked on just one park, Yosemite. And in three and a half years, I wrote about every disappearance in Yosemite up to that time, there were 106. And then Mike, guess what happened? The special agent in charge of Yosemite released a list of all the missing people in Yosemite. And that's when we knew we had our data right on that one park. The only park that has released a list of missing people. So do I think the National Park Service is hiding something? A hundred percent. 
Well, you know, this takes me to um, something that I've heard from a number of people that I've been kind of working with, interviewing, and they talk about human trafficking in space, that humans are genetically considered to be a precious commodity and that many extraterrestrial civilizations are willing to barter, um, hand over advanced technology to government authorities for breeding pairs of humans. Um, and so I guess that's a question that comes up is some of these missing people, are they taken up uh, as part of this kind of human trafficking into space and they're used as part of this kind of breeding program to whether it's to populate worlds, whether it's for whatever purpose an off-world civilization wants. But, um, you know, I mean, the, the national parks keeping it all secret, um, government authorities not wanting to pursue that. It's quite clear that whatever's happening is not something they want resolved. So I guess I just want to throw that out there as another explanation to consider. That's outside my pay grade, Mike. <laughs> it, I, I've heard this before, and our group just sticks with the facts. And I, I'm not going to discount anything until I can prove it's true or it's not true, but I respect what people say. Well, I know people who, who do say that can cite your work and say, well, here's an example of someone who's done a lot of empirical research and he's determined that, yeah, there's a lot of um, a lot of these missing persons and they disappear and national parks aren't, inter aren't interested and the government authorities aren't interested. And um, a lot of the, there's indications that people are being abducted because of their reproductive value. A lot of them tend to be German. So that is suggestive of something happening out involving UFOs, space, that requires people of German breeding capabilities and that this is a considered a valuable commodity. Yeah, I understand. Mm -hmm. And uh, our work gets cited by a lot of different groups because it is data and uh, the research stands up. So I, I understand that. Well, uh, I, I think uh, your movie, uh, the, the UFO connection missing 411 is, is really essential viewing and I, I recommend my audience to, to watch it. So, so where can people watch it? Where do they go? And, and your books as well. So uh, you get our books and you, if you want to get a DVD or a Blu-ray to one of our movies, come to our website, NA, like North America, BigfootSearch.com. Uh, if you want to watch the movie online, any of those movies, you can go to Amazon, Vimeo, iTunes, even if you're in another country, Vimeo and iTunes work. But uh, yeah, DVDs and uh, Blu-rays come to me online and go to those sources. And our books are, all 11 of my books and books on Bigfoot are through our website, NA, North, like North America, NA, BigfootSearch.com. And watch our 450 YouTubes at the Can-Am Missing Project on YouTube. Well, I want to thank you, David Polides, and sharing with us your incredible research into this uh, missing person phenomenon and uh, giving us some way of understanding exactly how extensive this is and what might be happening. So thank you. Well, Mike, it's been my honor to be on your show. Thanks for the invitation. You have been listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com.